Okay, hello everybody. My name is um, Aliyah Land of Alar. I am um, a, a assistant professor at Illinois State University. I'm also the co-director of um, of a OSEP grant titled El Vista, which is Early Learning Visual Impairment Services Training and Advancement. Um, and uh, I'm recording this to talk to you today about multicultural issues in visual impairments. Um, let me give you a little bit of my background. Uh, I have 17 years experience in early intervention to uh, 12th grade in public education. Um, so far, I have two years uh, of experience as an assistant professor and coordinator of low blind vision and blindness program at Illinois State University. Uh, I'm on my third year this year, um, and I really love it here. It's been, uh, they've been really wonderful to me. Um, I have various, various <laughs> certifications. Um, one of the ones that are, are, is most pertinent to um, our purposes today is uh, I have a cert teaching certificate as a teacher of the visually impaired, um, but I'm also an educational diagnostician, which is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, um, I'm, I'm pretty much like a school psychologist. Um, the main difference is that I don't do the assessments for autism or, or, um, or behavior uh, issues, but I do do all the learning uh, assessments, IQ, academic, um, and screenings for ADHD. Um, I'm also, I also have a certificate in bilingual education, uh, which the majority of my career has been in bilingual ed. Uh, elementary education, I have a master's um, in education and curriculum and instruction, and a PhD in special education with an emphasis in blindness vision impairment. Um, I was the lead bilingual educational diagnostician for the program for students with visual impairments in Houston ISD in Houston, Texas. I had about 300 kids on my caseload, so I was their, um, their case manager. Uh, every year I would have to go through and make sure that all of their assessments were uh, up to date. I would work with closely with the TBI, and um, and for early intervention, I'd work with the, the TBI, the parents, and any of the other developmental therapists that were involved with the student, uh, including speech, occupational, physical, um, and of course, uh, we we were lucky enough to have a nurse um, on our team, so we would have a what was called a nurse consultant go in and help us with uh, with families, um, and so. Um, I'll start off um, with this quote about multiculturalism, as is stated in the Webster Dictionary. Uh, multiculturalism is a preservation of different cultures or cultural identities within a unified society as a state or nation. So multiculturalism is, is very much a part of uh, our, our, our heritage here in the United States and definitely uh, what we are, uh, the times we're living in today. So before we move on, I want to be sure and kind of um, get with you, uh, uh, clarify some of the um, terms that are going to be used um, throughout this presentation, um, but they're all going to be referring to the, the same type of students. Um, so the term ELL stands for English Language Learners. Um, ELL and the term CLD which stands for culturally and linguistically diverse, and CLDB, culturally and linguistically diverse background, or bilingual, refer to the same population of students. Um, ELLVI and CLDBVI, or CLDVI, stands for English language learners who are visually impaired. So you might see uh, all these different terms being thrown around, but they are all referring to the same students. So uh, another really um, in good quote that kind of sets the stage for how we look at our students and how we work with them and their families who come from multicultural backgrounds. So, um, a child grows in and through contextually based relationships, an assessment of her developmental status is affected by her cultural context as well as the perspectives of the examiner and the reporting caregivers. So, when we are basically working with a child, working with their family, and and, and doing an assessment, we have to be very careful that you, um, that we, not just you, but we as assessors or as service providers do not try to impose the way we see um, the world through our eyes and our own cultural background. Um, sometimes you go into a home and or work with a family that um, 
values uh, parents being very involved and helping their children with every little thing. But And for us, we want our kids to be independent and we value that. Um, but some cultures don't necessarily value the strength or the importance of independence. So when we're giving an assessment to a child, if it seems like they can't do it or are not performing it, it may be because they've never been given the opportunity because of the family structure and the family belief systems and the, 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 the family culture um, has not really allowed for them to do a lot of these things independently. So that's why when we do interviews uh, with our families, we're doing an interview with our family, it's, it's extremely important um, so that we get a sense of maybe why this child's not doing something that we think they should be doing. Um, and so we get to look at they're not doing it, but can they do it? And then, so how can we measure that they can actually do it? They just haven't been given the opportunity. So you have to look at 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 at, at the whole child from it, from the perspective of what culture they come from and what their background is. And then not only that, but then what is the culture of the home? Because they can come from a different culture um, or from any other different background that has kind of like the stereotypical type of um, norms, I guess if you want to say. But then in the home, it's a little different. Um, they may have the overall um, culture, but in the home, they have their own specific culture that meets the family's needs. So for example, um, my background, I'm half Mexican and half Puerto Rican. And on the my Mexican side, um, you know, my family, my cousins, especially the females, were really not expected to be very independent. Um, I still have cousins who don't drive. Um, very, you know, to be very dependent on their husbands um, for everything, for decision making, for getting around, all those things. And and but in my family, my father decided that yes, that is part of our cultural norms in the the group family, the big family as a whole. But in our home, our culture is going to be that my daughters or the girls in the family will be as independent or as uh, and have their abilities to go and get a college education, make their own decisions, live on their own in, in our family, in our family culture, um, in our own home. But yet we live within the bigger culture of um, the machismo, where the male was uh, the one in control and making decisions, and the woman stayed home and cooked and cleaned and um, basically catered to the family. And you'll find that in lots of other cultures as well. But I'm just speaking from the perspective of the one that I grew up in. So let's look at some of the demographics that we have um, so far. Now, you, you have to remember, um, we right now don't have a very good system to actually monitor and um, count um, our students or individuals in general um, from that come from minority races or different or, or um, CLD background. So right now what we have based on um, Esri and the research that was done by, by Esri, we have right now about 11.5 million um, people who identify as minority race or ethnic or uh, minority ethnicity. So it looks like 52.8 million are Hispanics, 39.5 million are blacks, um, and 15.2 million are Asian American Indian Pacific Islander. And by 2015, it looks like uh, whites will no longer be in the majority, where 40% of children under five will be Hispanic. And so, um, again, my my background and my and my area of research is in working with children who are Spanish speakers, or their first language is Spanish. They're learning English, and who also have a disability, whether and multiple or multiple disabilities, which includes deaf blindness. So, we're, if we look at ELLs, it's a growing student population. So, we're looking at um, students who are ELLs are the fastest student uh, growing student population in the American education system. Um, we can also look at what um, Dr. Millian says in that the population of, of uh, linguistically diverse learners increases. As that increases, there is a subsequent increase in the population of bilingual students with visual impairments. 
Um, so if we look at from 1989 to 2000, the ELL population grew 105%. In contrast to the general student population growth of 12%. Um, and then as the number of students of, uh, who are ELL um, continue to grow, so too do the cases of teachers or students with visual impairment. So that is a crisis that we are facing in the field. As it is, we have a shortage of, of teachers, but then we are now starting to see that we not only have a shortage of teachers, but we have a shortage of teachers who are um, who, DBIs who are trained um, to deal with students from multicultural backgrounds uh, who are bilingual, who, might, who are Spanish speaking and need access to a bilingual curriculum um, that right now we don't have uh, TBIs who speak Spanish to be able to give our Spanish speakers access to the bilingual ed curriculum. So you know, we are looking at trying to write grants or offer programs that will prepare TBIs to actually be able to work with students with these backgrounds, with the, with a different uh, home language, and to also be able to give them the same access that their sighted peers have to ESL or bilingual instruction. So. ELL students in the U.S. are a heterogeneous population. Um, for the majority, Spanish is a native language, and ELL students uh, in the U.S. speak more than 450 languages. Um, a substantial share uh, are native speakers of Asian, Southeast Asian, and European languages. But the majority, I think, that we all come by um, and have access to are those who are Spanish speakers. Now, the languages spoken most frequently um, by ELL students are Spanish, Vietnamese, um, Hmong, Chinese, Cantonese, and Korean. Other languages such as Arabic, American, Chukese, French, Haitian Creole, Hindi, um, all these, all the ones that are listed, represent uh, are represented by less than one percent of the ELL student population. So you're more likely to have someone uh, or a student or family who are Spanish speakers um, and you know, it's a little easier right now to come by people who speak Spanish um, to help in translation or help with service provision. Um, but the goal that we need to start really looking at is trying to recruit teachers from different um, backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, so that we can start meeting the needs of our student population that is growing more, um, more diverse every day. So here's a chart um, and, and ranked, and this chart, you know, it's, it's over 10 years old, so I'm sure it's, um, the numbers have changed somewhat, uh, but I, I, I still would, would imagine that Spanish is um, still the leading uh, language um, spoken by ELLs. So you've got them all listed there, Spanish, Vietnamese, H1, Chinese, Cantonese, and Korean. So now, as far as, uh, you know, we have to look at all the statistics that I've been talking about already um, and, and, you know, pointing to is that um, they're all estimates. And we have to think about, remember that almost all statistics on blindness are estimated, which means that the numbers found in a sample are extrapolated to the entire population. Okay. So again, like I started out the, um, this presentation before mentioning that we just don't have a good way right now of counting everybody um, so that we have a more accurate number. Now with the new Sullivan Macy Act um, that hopefully will be passed, we will have a better way or at least start uh, to have a better way of tracking these individuals and counting them so that we have more accurate numbers. The more accurate our numbers, the better chances we have of obtaining external funding um, to recruit individuals from diverse backgrounds into the TBI field. So in the United States, so after looking at all those statistics and understanding now that they are um, estimates, um, one out of 20, which is 5% of preschool age children, will have a vision problem that affects their ability to learn. Okay, so that's based on 
based on um, Prevent Blindness America and their statistical uh, machine there. So, but in 2012, 2011 to 2012, the public school enrollment data, we're, we're looking at 4.4 million public school students in the United States were English language learners. To me, that number sounds very, very low, considering that I came from, or I am from, Houston, Texas, which has about 4 million people in it but all alone. Um, and then we had um, about 300 students in Houston ISD itself who are blind, visually impaired, and over half of those students were bilingual, Spanish speakers. We had other languages as well, but the majority of the ELOs in our uh, program of 300 were Spanish speakers. So to me, it just seems like that 4.4 million is um, extremely underestimated. But again, like I mentioned before, that's kind of all we have to go by until we are able to really get a better way um, to count individuals and have them counted for each of their disabilities and not just a general uh, multiple disabled category. So we looked at those numbers and all the extrapolations. So we're looking at uh, how many learners are both ELL and blind visually impaired? 5% of 4.4 million ELL students equals 220,000. Preschool age students who are ELL, yeah, again, looking at that number, I know that, I mean, there's, it, that's an impossibly low number. There is, uh, it's difficult for me to imagine that 220,000 is all we have throughout all 50 states across the United States. Uh, but again, this is the best we have with what we've been given so far. So now we're talking about multiculturalism and, and visual impairment. And the main thing about a lot of the, this, the information that we're going to talk about, that we are talking about in this presentation, um, is not only relevant to ELOs who are VI, um, but also just in general, developing that cultural competency will help you not only with our population of students, but will also help you when dealing with other populations of students who are not necessarily visually impaired. So like one of the, there, there's four steps that we have here um, that talk about how you develop cultural competency. So if we look at step one, you would identify the cultural values that are embedded in the professional interpretation of a student's family's difficulties. Two, find out whether the family being served recognizes and values these assumptions and if not, how their views differ from that of the professional. Step three, acknowledge and give explicit respect to any cultural differences identified and fully explain the cultural basis of the professional assumptions. And step four, through discussion and collaboration, determine the most effective way of adapting professional interpretation or recommendations to the value system of this family. So when you're looking at these, basically it's just telling us that when we go in there and we want to teach our, our babies or our families and, and or our young children to be independent because that is a big one for us in this field. We, we strive to make sure our students can be independent. Um, we need to understand that, again, in some family structures, having the children be independent is not necessarily valued or a goal that they really want to pursue for their child. So... If that is a goal that we are looking at trying to help the student achieve, and we need to make sure that the parents understand that we are not trying to um, change their beliefs and trying to um, have the student be so independent that they don't, that they don't, um, or that the families feel that they don't need them anymore, or that the, the independence leads to disrespect. Um, of some kind, of some sort, because sometimes that it can be seen that way depending on the cultural background of the family. Um, and explain that this is part of our curriculum for the school, and, the, you know, if we can get the students to be independent at school, then they're meeting the needs of the, they're meeting our curricular needs, um, and, and, they're, and the student is making progress toward those curricular needs, but at home, they, they can go back to if they want their, the, the children to be dependent on them or interdependent. Um, that can still happen in the home. We're not trying to say that what they're doing is bad. We are just trying to 
help the child uh, fulfill the needs that are in the curriculum so that the child can progress in school. So, you know, there's different ways to approach this, and you have to maintain that um, sensitivity towards, uh, you know, what the family's cultural expectations are versus what the American school cultural expectations are. So there is a YouTube video that um, I play sometimes when I'm doing a presentation like this, uh, which the link is there for you to look at if you choose to go and, um, and listen to it. It's a very short video. But basically, it's having people say hello in all the different languages. And the reason I feel that that is um, extremely important, because if you approach a family and show them and say hello in their language, it is showing them that you value their, their culture and their, their language. And so that will break down a huge barrier uh, for some of these families, um, not necessarily babies in the home, just families in general. When you get your caseload, you want to get to know the families. You definitely want them to see that you value and respect them and value and respect their beliefs and their culture. Um, and if you do that, then that helps a lot with um, moving your your student forward and progressing in, in their, and meeting their goals. But also, it, it helps the families become your ally. Um, if the families are on your side, you can get a lot more done um, at the school level if you and the families are on the same page. And one way to do that is to show is to say hello or goodbye in their language. And that really does show that you respect them. Um, and like I've done that before, walking into a home where um, the family was um, Islamic, and uh, as soon as the uh, wife and the husband came to the front door, um, I was going in to do a family interview. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not really good at Arabic, but I did say "Assalamu alaikum," and right away they were like, "Oh, you speak Arabic?" And I was like, "No, I don't speak Arabic," <laughs> but you know, I, I, I wanted to say hello to you in something that you're accustomed to um, from others. Um, in your culture and in your family and right away the barriers came down and they started teaching me all kinds of words in Arabic um, And so, you know, I I was able to use some of the words that they taught me to work with their child um, But also it just it, like I said it just melted away Any kind of fear or animosity that they had towards an outsider coming into the home So it's really important uh, Just a, a basic thing saying hello say goodbye um, in their language. Now, the other issue with cultural um, beliefs and backgrounds is, um, you know, what are some of the beliefs about the causes of disabilities? There's a lot of false information about disabilities. Much of it is family and cultural beliefs, which are unconsciously assimilated during childhood through folklore. So, um, you know, one of the false beliefs that can be you know, associated with going blind or having issues with seeing are like having excessive crying or sleeping with wet hair or practicing witchcraft or wearing rubber boots in the wrong time or place, giving somebody the evil eye, frights, like they're just scared or somebody scares them all the time, having an evil hex or being very nervous or being a punishment or a gift from God. You know, and I look at this and I just remember growing up in, in, my, in my household where I grew up uh, with the Puerto Rican side mainly of the family. I did go visit the Mexican side, but for the most part, we, you know, I grew up in a Puerto Rican home. And I, you know, sleeping with wet hair was one that I always remember uh, my grandmother talking about. But one of the other things was, um, like, if she was sweeping the kitchen uh, or anywhere, and I was there, if the broom swept over my feet, that means that I would never get married, which is silly, right? You think about sweeping a broom over your feet, but that's like that old folklore type wives tale type of beliefs that um, if, you know, my feet got swept with a broom, I would not get married. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it sounds silly, uh, but that's really something that, you know, my grandmother wholeheartedly believed. That we really weren't allowed to be anywhere near a broom when she was sweeping the house or, you know, working on it. Um, same thing with, um, you know, sitting on something that's warm. Um, you wouldn't be able to have babies or putting your purse on the floor. If you put your purse on the floor, that means that money's going to leave your purse really fast. So just silly things like that or the evil eye. You know, if somebody's been staring at your baby or your, the child for a long time or a lot, 
and not going over to touch the child, then that's like you've given the child the evil eye. The child's going to get sick or, you know, something bad will happen to them, which makes no logical sense. But that is something that happens in a lot of different cultures. And so you have to be careful that when you are talking to the family that they, that you don't react when they say, well, you know, we told her not to be sleeping with wet hair and that's why now she's going blind. You know, you might be talking to a parent who's got a, a student who's got a retinitis pigmentosa. So that is a progressive disease, eye disease, and eventually you will go blind with RP. It's not because the child was sleeping with wet hair. It's because that is the um, effect that RP has on on the visual world. Um, and so, you know, you have to be careful not to turn around and say, oh, well, that's silly or that's impossible. You know, you can say, well, you know, that might be one of the issues, but also remember, you know, part of her, this, the, your child's visual impairment, um, part of the diagnosis or prognosis is that she is going to be losing her vision. It may not necessarily always be because she was sleeping with wet hair. And then give them information in a language that they understand that will explain the uh, progression of RP. And so you can do that without making them feel silly or feel inadequate because they wholeheartedly believe in these other ways of uh, what caused the blindness for their child. Now, when concerns arise that, you know, then with a parent or with a family, then, you know, as a practitioner, you need to gather information from the family by asking, is there a problem or is this part of the prognosis? Again, it goes back to the RP. If she's losing her vision, is it because she was sleeping with wet hair or is it because that is part of um, the eye condition? It's progressive. Um, and so not necessarily because her hair was wet and sleeping with her hair wet. Um, why is there a problem? What do you think caused the problem? Again, you might get, get an answer that says that, that where somebody says, well, she was sleeping with wet hair, um, and that's, uh, that's why she's going blind. Well, that may be what the, what the family thinks caused the problem, but then we can also say, okay, I, I understand that. Um, and then here's the report from the doctor that also says, this is why, why there is a problem here. So that, yes, you're not taking away the belief system, and you're, but you're actually letting them continue on with that belief system, but also showing them the, the, the hard science and documentation as to why this is happening. Um, and then the families can make that determination on their own um, without you putting your, um, your own perception of, of, of culture and reality uh, and your own spin on it, your own biases on it. And then, you know, what can be done? What interventions would be appropriate? And that's where you come in as a TVI that you will be working on preparing the student um, to be a tactile learner if they're going to lose their vision eventually. Um, those are some of the interventions that would be appropriate. If we already know that she's he or she is losing their vision, then, then you would talk about that. Um, you know, or uh, for orientation mobility, you know, making sure that the child is able to travel safely and how are we going to do this? Where are we going to do this? Is it going to be something that we need to generalize from home to school and vice versa? And of course, who can help? Would it be the doctor? Would it be the TBI? Would it be the own man? Or would it be, um, you know, it could be a grandmother or a caregiver working with the TBI. So, or own man or OT or PT. So, or, or a physician. Um, so those are, these are some of the um, questions that you can ask yourself when you come into or across a family that might have um, beliefs that are contrary to yours. So recommendations, you know, you need to consider the pre- and post-immigration experiences of these families. So if you think about, like right now with this big refugee crisis that's happening, um, all these people are fleeing horrible conditions. And then they end up on our doorsteps. And we have to provide services for these babies or these family members or these children who have never been served before in their, um, in their home countries. Um, and, you know, the, it may have been very traumatic for them going through every, you know, everything that they've gone through to get here from way on the other side of the world. Um, so you need to really consider that when it comes to how you approach the families. They may not be very trusting um, or they may be very trusting. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, considering those things. 
um, using interpreters or interveners and not in the deafblind sense. So if we have a family who is only Spanish speaking and they may have an older child who speaks English fluently, then that person might be the interpreter for the family. It might help you explain to the family or translate to the family for you. Uh, or they can intervene by, you know, I, they may be the caregiver during the day and then at night, you know, the, the child is back with the, the parents. So they would be, you would be talking to the interveners or have them be the present so that they can help explain to you, to you and the parents of the things that this child is doing at home, especially if the parents are out working. So they would need the intervener person to come in um, and help us deal with um, the family and the issues. You want to ask their families about their cultural expectations of early development. So we might disagree that um, a family is still giving their child uh, milk in a bottle at two years old. Um, that may not be our cultural expectations, but that is probably that may be somebody else's cultural expectation, um, and that sometimes will affect speech. Um, and you know, I know I've heard that from speech therapists before. So you have to be careful not to tell the families. Um, well, you know, the baby really shouldn't be drinking milk from a bottle at two years old. They need to be, you know, drinking from a cup and all these other things, which, you know, will, it will offend them and they may not ever want to deal with you or they may, you know, at all, whether it's at, at the home or at the school. So, you know, talking to them about what their, what their cultural expectations are of, in early development, um, it's really important that will help you decide and help guide your, uh, planning uh, for these students. So throughout your time with the family from referral, identification, service, and transition, validate the family's cultural belief system. Don't ever make them feel like what they believe is silly, wrong, um, you know, outdated. Always validate their cultural belief system, um, you know, by acknowledging something that, that, that they told you about their culture or if it's a um, particular food or a particular type of ceremony. Uh, I know for me, when I was working in the home and I had babies that would transfer or, you know, make that transition uh, from early intervention to preschool, the families uh, would have, like, I, I've been where a Hindu family had, like, a little ceremony for, for the baby and for me since we were going to be parting ways and I had such a good effect on their on their family life and on um, uh, on their on their child um, that they wanted to send both of us off in this transition uh, with a blessing and so that what and, you know Hindus have many gods so that their the particular god that they prayed for would watch over me and the baby who was transfer making that transition so that we would keep, you know, moving on and helping people. Um, and so, you know, that right there, being willing to take part in that ceremony, showed them that, yes, I valued their cultural belief system. You also need to become very self-aware and learn about your own cultural framework, worldview, power, and privilege position. I know that's funny to say power and privilege because we're teachers, but from a family's point of view, we are in that position of power and privilege. You know, we've, we've seen different things than they've seen. We, we're educated. We have a different level of vocabulary, um, different ideas of what should be happening outside of that family's home. So we need to be careful that we don't bring those expectations to the home where the family is or to the family at school during a meeting or to the child if you're doing, providing services and telling them that, oh, wait a minute, you know, this is wrong. Uh, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, depending on anybody to get your tray for you from the lunch counter and then bring it to your table. I mean, that's wrong. Instead of saying that's wrong, say, well, you know, we really need to work on our independence and, uh, you know, you need, we need you to understand where your food comes from. And that, that it doesn't just show up at the table for you. you it, not everybody's going to be there to help you all the time. So let's do this. But you're not putting, you're not downing their cultural um, backgrounds or their own cultural expectations. Okay. Um, 
And, you know, you think about what values or beliefs or cultural messages you receive about family interaction and child rearing. So, you know, I, I had to think about when, like, when I grew up, would children were to be seen and not heard. So uh, I've had to, and, and when I deal with families that, that have that same kind of cultural expectation about their children, um, a lot of times when you're trying to ask a child or ha ask the student any questions when you're assessing them or working with them and they are very timid, don't look you in the eye, don't really answer or they answer real softly, it's not because they don't want to work with you or not because they don't want to participate. It's just that they have been taught that children are to be seen and not heard. And so when an adult asks a, a child a question, sometimes they feel like they really are not supposed to answer it because it's, it's a child talking to an adult. And that sometimes goes against the cultural norms. So you have to think about that. What are some of those things that, that you bring to the table when you are working with a family and the student? So make sure that you are uh, aware of your thoughts. You know, like children who come to school dirty are blank, blank, blank. Parents who smoke are, you know, are silly uh, or are not putting their children first. Um, parents who sleep with their kids, that's ridiculous. You know, they should be sleeping in their own bed by this age or that age or whatever. So, you know, you think about that. Think about your own thoughts so that before you go to that house, if you find out that, um, you know, the child is coming to school dirty because the, the family can't pay the water bill uh, or because, you know, the landlord won't fix the water. And I know I've lived through that. I've worked with people like that who were the nicest people in the world and wanted the best for the child, but they lived in a, in a really low-income uh, facility that where the landlord just didn't care whether or not they had clean running water. So sometimes, you know, the, the mothers would have to go out and get some water from somebody's water hose and bathe their children from a bucket with a, with a napkin, or I mean with a, with a, um, a washcloth, which, you know, it's, it's amazing to think about that that would happen here in this country now, but it does. I mean, it was happening right across the street from my house. So I know that this can happen. So you got to remember, it's not that their parents don't care about their kids. It's like they may not have the means to be able to do it. Parents who sleep with their kids, I know for me, I have one daughter. She's the only one I'm ever going to have. So I like for her to sleep with me because I know that she's going to be safe if she's right next to me. Now, growing up in my household, there were a lot of us. And, you know, my parents, we always, we all shared beds. There was so many of us, none of us had a bed to ourselves. So it's just kind of, it, it's, a, it's a norm for me. It's, a, it's, it's not out of the ordinary um, for my daughter to sleep in my bed. But other, other cultures, and for us as TBIs, would come in and be like, wait a minute, you know, this is, this child needs to have their own bedroom, that's weird, but not, it's not weird for that person, it's weird for us, because we might, we're, we're coming in from the outside looking in. Um, parents who carry their children all the time, that's also another cultural issue, and I know we, we want our babies to, and our, our children to walk and crawl and do all the things that they're supposed to do on their own because that helps with brain development. Um, and so it, we have to be very delicate when we approach that subject with a family who likes to carry their children all the time and let them know that it's not that we don't agree with that, that they, you know, not carry their children all the time, but that part of going through school is they're not going to have anybody to carry them through school, so we've got to get them to be able to walk and and, and, you know, be independent. And then when they're home, they can be carried all the time if that's what you choose. Um, so we, you know, these are just some of the thoughts that we need to be aware of before we go in and working with a family, whether it's in the home or at a school or at a school meeting. So when you sample questions to consider when working with cultural di culturally diverse families or cultural diverse families, um, you know, who are the key members of this family system? Is it the mom, dad? Is it the grandma? Is it the, the grandpa, the uncle? Or maybe even the cousin who speaks English um, and the rest of the family doesn't? So, you know, that, that's the person that kind of, um, you know, runs that family and the family system. Um, it is, is the family group-oriented or collectivist or individual-focused or individualistic? My family is very group-oriented. We don't really like to make big decisions without consulting everybody first. Um, so, you know, you might be at, a, at an IEP meeting and you have the parents and the cousin and maybe the grandparents sitting there as well. They all want to be involved. They're very group-oriented, and that's okay. 
Um, you know, when we talk about who are the key members of the family system, um, you know, I think about the homes that I went into and the families that I interacted with when I was in Houston. And um, walking into a home where the family is, uh, they're Muslim, uh, you know, understanding that the mother may not be making all the decisions and that I would have to talk to the father before, and the father would have to be present for me to come over uh, and work with the child. So understanding that, then that will help you um, when it comes to setting meetings, getting information. Um, you would, you know, be able to address um, maybe a packet that a family needs to fill out, address it to the father, since we know that the father is the one who's um, the key member of the family, or address it to the cousin, whoever that person would be. Um, is this family system open or closed to outsiders? That's also, also um, extremely important. Um, you know, so part of the ways to address the closed system is again to kind of learn the basic um, greetings in a different language, maybe some key words, because um, that will help break down those 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 boundaries um, with the family. Um, so that way they're not so close to outsiders coming into the home to work with them. Um, so, and what is the family's view or perspective about disability? Some families think that you know what my child has a disability. There, I don't expect them to be able to do anything. So I don't really need you know, services. My child doesn't need services. They just need to go to school, do what they can, and then that's it. So our job is to show the families that even though their the child has a disability um, and they perceive that as like being, you know, the child's going to be worthless and they can't do anything, that we can actually show them um, the child being independent, let's say picking up a spoon and eating their own cereal on their own, um, and that that's something that they can learn. So, you know, you think about that, and it, and it sounds really harsh when you, you come across a family that says, well, they can't do anything anyway. You know, they're just here. So, you know, I, I, we just feed them. We don't really play or anything because, you know, they don't understand, which the child may actually understand. It's just they haven't given them an opportunity. So, you know, looking at what their perspective is on, about the disability will help you uh, prepare, uh, you know, on how to deal with, a situation that might arise when you're trying to work with this family or if they're just not accepting services and understand why they don't want the services. Okay, other cross-cultural considerations. Um, you know, how might cultural values influence these activities? So feeding, dressing, reading and writing tools. Um, you know, feeding and dressing might be where only the woman does the feeding and the dressing of the child or, you know, the females in general um, in the family. And only the men will help with reading and writing uh, or playing with toys. Like, you know, is, is it important for, are toys important in, in that particular culture? Um, you know, it, it mirrors may not be, uh, you know, important in a culture. I know um, if you work with anybody from the Amish community, they may, they don't have mirrors. Um, you know, so you may not want to bring in a mirror so that you can play people with the child or you may, you know, uh, those are the type of issues that you really need to know about because you don't want to offend anybody, uh, working with the families, whether it's in the home or at the schools. So understanding that, um, you know, will definitely help you avoid, um, insulting a family, but also help you work through the family systems in a way that it would still allow you to progress uh, and help the child progress um, academically or um, life skills wise. So who should be involved in discussion? So in some cultures, a mother uh, playing with her child may not seem appropriate. Uh, the role is more of a caregiver and not as a playmate. So uh, maybe the mother is just, you know, very, not cold, but that is just, you know, they, they have the baby, now they have somebody else that does all the playing. The mother has a very strict role in this child's life, um, you know. So it could be, uh, it could be the, the siblings that are the ones that, that play, and only the mother does the feeding and the changing and all of that stuff. Um, sometimes the siblings or any others in the child's life may need to be on in the discussion um, for that reason. So it could be that the aunt stays with the baby while the parents go work during the day, 
Um, and they're the ones that uh, that are like the playmate. They're not so much the caregiver, but the playmate of the child, the babysitter. Um, so, you know, looking at do that, does that person need to be involved in any discussion that we have regarding um, the education plan for the student? Um, also, are the community referral agencies familiar with or sensitive to multicultural issues? You know, immigration status or religious affiliation. Immigration status, that a lot of times that, that scares families um, that who may not be here legally. Um, so they may not want to seek out um, assistance for their child because they're afraid they're going to be caught. Not understanding that we cannot report them. It's not our job to report people who are here legally or illegally. Our job is to go in and help the family uh, and, the, and, the, and the child. Uh, and so, you know, looking at that, understanding that they may be reluctant to seek out uh, any help from outside entities uh, may, make, you know, will, may make your job a little harder, um, but you've got to be sensitive to that and be able to explain to them that. Or have somebody at the community referral at the agency um, that will that explain to them that we do not report individuals to immigration. Um, you know, or even or religious affiliation. Uh, if they're Jehovah Witnesses, they may not believe in some of the surgeries or some of the things that need to happen um, to help their child survive, to help their child progress. Um, you know, things like that. So you have to look at are the are the referral agencies aware or familiar? Uh, and so part of your job could be to when you make a referral that you you speak to somebody at that receiving agency. Or make a note so that uh, in the application or wherever it may be, so that um, the service provider from the referral agency is aware of uh, the family's reluctance, maybe or over dependence, maybe on what what uh, what might be offered. Um, so you know, if you accompany the family or help with the phone call, uh, that that may help with those those issues. Because um, sometimes simply giving a phone number or a pamphlet may not suffice. Um, you know, it's just another piece of paper for the family, and they've got times if they have a child with a disability already. What I used to do um, in order for my students to start receiving services from outside agencies is I would just set a time when I would go and meet with the parents, either at the home or at the school, and we would sit and make the phone calls together um, so that I knew that they were trying to get on the list for services or talking to somebody about social work services or anything like that I made sure that I was right there and they felt comfortable with me being there so that I could help them understand some of the things that maybe the, the person on the other end of the phone was talking about uh, some jargon that they don't understand so it's really important that as TBIs we go in to help uh, with with a lot of these issues and advocate translate you know help the parents understand what is going on when you're calling these, these service agencies um, and, and what kind of services they can actually provide. There, there's a really good resource um, that I've listed here. It's called the uh, Community University Partnership Cup for the Study of Children, Youth, and Families, and it's in Alberta, Canada. Um, they, uh, they, they do a lot of research on childhood screening and immigrant and refugee families in Canada. Um, the 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 PI is Rebecca uh, Gogert, and um, the, what they have they put together a handbook, cross cultural handbook, and I have the link there, um, and it, it's it's very helpful. A lot of the material from this presentation came from that uh, that handbook. So if you get a chance, you should download it and uh, read through it and keep it with you, uh, and you know so that you have something to refer to when you get a, a new student on your caseload that may be from, um, you know, a CLD background. We also have to remember we have to maintain respect for cultural traditions and values. Um, you know, you've got to remember, you know, determine that protocol for cross-gender interaction in the culture. So, like I said, walking into a home where the family is Muslim, you know, I have to understand that uh, I had to have my head covered and my shoes off when I walked into a home where the family was Muslim. Um, and that I would not be able to talk to the father unless my head was covered. Um, and so, you know, that, that's extremely important. 
um, and also not be in the room alone with the father, making sure that, you know, I was always accompanied by someone else in the family with the father in the room or any male in the room. Um, and, you know, in most cultures, topics pertaining to child care are the most responsibility. However, depending on the research topic in some cultures, it is important to consult both parents. So, um, you know, again, sometimes a father is the one that needs to know everything and makes the decisions, and the, the mother just makes sure that, it, that she sees it through. Um, so, you know, think about who is who's responsible for the care of the child. Then that will help you determine who you need to be talking to. Um, determine the rules about greeting family members, deciding a sitting place in the house, and accepting refreshments. So, greeting family members, you know, in my culture, in my household, we hugged everybody, the, even the first time we met them. Um, but, you know, it, it's pretty much the social norm to shake somebody's hand. But if you're female, you may not really want to shake the male's hand who opens the door for you because then the mother might see that as uh, you are uh, flirting or trying to be aggressive with her husband. Um, or the husband, you know, it might be a sign that, like, you're, you're disrespectful or disrespecting yourself. So, you know, be very careful and think about all those things when you are um, ready to consult with the family. Um, accepting refreshments. Some cultures, I know, like, like I said, I've been in some homes where as soon as I get there, they have, um, you know, they'll, they have some treats set out, um, and will bring me something to drink. Uh, maybe a chai tea or a Turkish coffee or something like that. Um, you know, it's always, it, it's, it's, it might seem rude in their eyes to say, oh, no, thank you, I've already eaten. Um, so it's just nice to accept it and then just put it, if you don't, if you don't drink it or don't want it, that's fine. You accepted it, you put it next to you um, so that they understand that, you, you know, you are, you are there to help them and that, that the relationship needs to be reciprocal. Um but it is it is helpful to accept any food or anything that they that they try to give you because um, you know it's showing that you respect them and respect their cultural and their cultural background and their family and cultural ways um, and make sure that you're dressed appropriately. Keep in mind the customs in a family. So wearing a short skirt may not cut it if you're going to see a family that's very conservative. Um, wearing open-toed shoes may not be appropriate. Um, if you're going to see a family very conservative uh, or has religious beliefs um, that, to the contrary, uh, about women wearing any kind of revealing um, clothes. So, you know, having an extra change of clothes in the car or calling ahead of time before and maybe just having a frank conversation and ask, you know, before I go to the home, is there anything I need to know about dress or anything like that? Um, because it is their home we're walking into. They are being gracious enough let us walk in or it's their lives that we're walking into and so whether because we may not all be working in the homes we may be working at the school but understanding that when a father or somebody comes into a male presence is in the meeting with a bunch of women understanding that um, he or may not he may not want to speak with you directly because you might be wearing something that's inappropriate in his eyes or her eyes so um, you know understand and keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, collaborating with these families so you know what not to wear uh, here's an example here a service provider was a short skirt to the family home where the women practice full body covering the mother father and extended family members were not comfortable sharing the needs of their family with the service provider as her dress was not appropriate for the cross-gender interaction so you know we can definitely have an impact on the level of services that we can provide to the student if the families are not comfortable enough talking with us, uh, it, whether that's in a home or in, a, in an IEP meeting. So, you know, make sure that um, you understand the protocols of the families, okay, um, before you go in and, and work with them or meet with them at, at, in a school setting. Specific cultural groups, there are different considerations for them. Each culture is distinct. Um, you know, within a culture, there exists a diversity of values, practices, and beliefs. So like I was mentioning to you before, within the, the Hispanic culture in Houston, where I grew up, you know, there was one set of beliefs. But then um, within my own home, we had a, we had a diversity of beliefs. Um, in addition to the overall cultural values that we hold, um, as Latin American or Hispanic American people. 
So like, for, you know, one of the examples I give here is when working with Muslim families, providers should understand that the customs for cross-gender interactions in which a female provider should not shake hands, develop eye contact, excuse me, contact, or interact jokingly with males in the family. You have to be real careful about that. Um, again, it could be a misinterpretation on the father's end that you're interested in this person and then the mother is the one that's uh, upset and doesn't want you back in the home. So, you know, you just think they're, they're, they seem ridiculous and they seem petty, but it, it is a reality that we live in and that we work in. So even at an IP meeting, sitting right next to the father may not be the best thing. Maybe you should sit next to the mother. Um, you know, it just you have to really get to know your families in order to know how to approach them and what things are going to um, fly and what things are going to um, be a sign of disrespect in their eyes. So another consideration is um, the country of origin and conditions of departure. So based on conditions of departure, the immigrant and refugee family situation varies. Um, in a survival environment, such as pre-immigration experiences of refugees like wars and years in refugee camps in other countries, kind of like what we're going through now, children may have limited opportunity to engage with certain activities and objects that are presented in screening tools and intervention services. So if um, we bring certain tools that we want to use to measure whether or not a student is, um, you know, uh, achieving a skill that we have been working on, um, they, they may not be able to do it because it's not something that they have ever seen or were presented with. Um, the, you know, if they were in transit from one country to another, fleeing um, violence and war, um, you know, basically for them, the... Um, what they placed value on and importance on was survival, not can my, you know, here are these toys for my child to play with. Um, and so, you know, you can think of that when you are uh, working with these families, like again, whether it's in the home or in an IEP meeting, you know, working with them, you, you really need to take into consideration as to why maybe they don't feel something is important to use or to have over others. Um, and this can have some impact on your screening and any services. So, um, you know, unfamiliarity with certain activities and objects can influence how a parent responds to certain questions or requests for participation and how children perform on screening tools or during services. So sometimes our screening tools ask a lot about um, feeding, uh, adaptive behavior, maybe, you know, do they uh, go potty training, um, th those kinds of things. So if you're not familiar with what some of the family beliefs are, the cultural beliefs about children, then they may not get credit for being able to do or perform a, uh, an activity on a screening, but it's not because they, they can't do it, it's just that they haven't been given the opportunity to do it. So, you know, when you are, uh, if you're screening a student or doing some type of evaluation, you always need to keep that in mind um, so that the results are not skewed against a child, and then that will also help you develop an a intervention plan um, to help the child with reaching a certain goal if you understand that they they can't do it right now because they haven't been exposed but if i expose them to this and we work on this that they may be able to uh, fulfill uh, whatever steps that need to be filled to reach the goal of their iep um a set we we talked about conditions of departure now the context of arrival some immigrant and refugee families are from cultural backgrounds that um, that's a new emerging that is a new emerging community. These families may not be able to easily find support from their own community because they're new, um, and this can lead to families to live in isolation from friends and family, who would in their home country be directly involved in the child development process. So, you know, these these people have left their homes and left everything behind. They don't have um, a family near them to help them with a child. So. Um, they are a little stressed. They feel isolated. Um, they then they don't want outsiders coming in. So you have to think about their the context of arrival for these families. Some of them are very traumatized. They they need time to settle in. Um, you know, so it it is really important for us to keep those things in mind. Keep patience or have patience. Um, and try to help bring down those barriers again that we discussed earlier. 
um, you know, because the, the families are very leery um, authority figures, um, they may not want to engage in screening or intervention because they have, you know, other concerns to address. Um, again, it could be that their main thing is survival right now. They're not worried about whether or not their kid can stack blocks uh, or, you know, their, if their kid can write their name. That, that's like one of the last things on their mind right now. They're just trying to figure out where the next meal is going to come from. Um, but also, you know, they because they're isolated, they may not have access to health services without the support of others. So if they feel like they can't speak the language, they're likely not to go to a doctor to get help for a cold or get the eye doctor exam. Uh, and so that's where your cultural brokers or interveners come in. Uh, cultural brokers meaning that there would be the ones that would interpret for the family to a doctor or explain, you know, issues as to why the family does this or doesn't do a certain thing um, based on their cultural background and their cultural norms. And they're still trying to assimilate into um, the culture of the United States. English is often not their first language. Um, they often speak multiple languages, and some of them have their own unique structure and communication style, like direct versus non-direct. That may be different from English. Um, you know, developmental screening tools, unfortunately, are primarily available in English and are only English speaking. Um, for, in, are made for those people who are only English speaking. So some of the questions that we ask will be cultural, culturally biased because it may, be, it may not be something that they have ever been exposed to in their culture. And so they don't know what we're talking about, they're going to get it wrong. Uh, but if we were able, if they had time to be exposed to certain different things in our culture, they may actually get that same question correct. Um, you know, some of these screening tools have long questions, unclear examples, and words that are not commonly used in everyday language or cannot be translated. Um, and so, you know, bringing the information down to a level that, this, that, that uh, parents and families and children can understand, uh, but really, but while not changing the, the, the test itself, but you're getting the information you need to be able to develop a plan for the student. Um, you know, a lot of times these parents don't understand what the questions are. What are they being asked to answer? Um, and they may not respond in a way that reflects uh, the developmental skills of their child um, because they're confused about it. It may be using word, big words that they're not accustomed to uh, when we can use simpler words that would get the point across. So a lot of these things can impact um, the way the results come from doing any assessments on our, on our students so that we can write appropriate IEP goals. Yeah, think about the religion as well. Uh, you know, they are, uh, many immigrant and refugee families want to preserve their cultural identity. Wanting to preserve that is a priority. Uh, religious beliefs are part of the cultural identity of the families and influence their social behavior, gender roles, parental responsibilities, and child expectations. So you got to think about that too. If the child's not doing something that you think they should be doing, you need to look at, well, what is their, what is their background? It may be a cultural thing that they're not doing a certain uh, activity or performing or demonstrating a certain skill because they're just, it's not appropriate for them to do that. Um, so for some of the impacts for this would be certain activities or objects and screening tool questions, like does your child turn the pages of a book by himself, uh, which is a fine motor question, may be in contrast with religious beliefs that parents are trying to teach their child as a result may influence a child's exposure to an activity or object. For example, in some Muslim communities, it is believed that the Quran should be the first book introduced to a child, and exposure to other books might influence um, to the extent to which a child treats the Quran as sacred, to be handled with the utmost care. So for us, bringing in uh, the very hungry caterpillar may not be the best thing for that child because the family is wanting that child to first learn how to handle the Quran and not, not be so um, concerned about children's books. Um, and so, you know, though sometimes that goes against our training and beliefs as, as instructors um, or as teachers, but it's, it's definitely still something that we need to take into consideration uh, when we're bringing in toys or um, trying to stress the importance of being able to, um, you know, flip open the pages of a book. Oral versus written culture. Um, some of the cultures that we might work with are from an oral culture um, and, and where, you know, their social transactions or stories are, tr are transmitted orally. 
Um, storytelling is more widely used uh, in parent-child activity than reading books. So when we, you know, tell our families you need to be reading with your child at home, that may not be something that they are accustomed to doing because most of what they've done and what's valued in their culture is the oral storytelling. Um, so, you know, you have to keep that in consideration um, as well. Uh, and maybe work with the family and say, okay, you're teaching the child about the Quran at home and how to handle that book. When we're at school, we're going to be, uh, you know, we'll, we will teach your child how to handle library books in the same uh, delicate way that you were teaching them to handle the Quran. So um, I think it's very, uh, very important to, to continue and keep that um, in mind when you're working with these families. So limited experience in a written culture may cause parents to mistrust the screening and intervention process that is completed in writing. And, you know, we have to have written document. Written documentation is everything here. Uh, and it may not have been everything from where they come from. So we have to keep in mind that we might send home a permission slip or uh, send home the IEP documents for the parents to look at and, and approve or come with questions to the meeting. But they may come with, with no questions because for them, looking at this paperwork doesn't really mean a whole lot to them. Um, but talking about what that what's on the paper means a lot more. So, you know, the meeting might go a little longer than what you think because the parent may not have valued getting the information in writing ahead of time. Um, let's see. Same thing with um, some of the screening tools, you know, express or ask uh, the children to show a particular skill using like pens or pencils um, <clears throat> or books. But then, you know, the children, because they may not have been exposed to these objects and may not perform well on those questions. They may never have held a um, pen in their hand or a pencil in their hand. Uh, they've never needed to. Um, books were, you know, depending on where they're from, may be non-existent and not important because the families are worried more about surviving than they are about going to the library or getting library books. Some cultures are in, interdependent or independent. So like if we're looking at immigrant families, uh, refugee families, like um, Chinese, South Asian, and African families, they come from interdependent cultures. Um, there they recognize that uh, by significant, their the recognition by significant others uh, and being able to fit into social roles within the community is highly valued, okay? Um, in, the, in that particular culture, uh, how to be independent, like using a spoon or reaching for things at an early age is not as important as certain social skills, like greeting, respecting elders, taking care of younger children, or getting along with others. Um, and we, like again, as a TVI, we focus on those areas at the ECC that require um, the student to be independent enough to feed themselves. In that culture at home, it, that may not be the case at all. Like, they're not worried about it. Um, so, you know, we have to do this, this balancing act and things to, to consider uh, when we're looking at the different cultures. Um, you know, some of this, the screening tests that we give or some of the IEPs that we write um, require our children to, you know, to display independent skills but may not reflect what the families consider important in interdependent cultures. So, you know, we don't want to... Uh, penalize a student for not being able to or for not being independent when that's something that's not valued in their home or in their culture. So, but we need to look at can they be independent? And if they can, then yeah, that's great. But also understand that in that culture, being independent is not highly valued. So you may not get as much support as you would like for that. But that, again, that comes where, that comes in where you um, learn some of the language of the family and that way you can actually have a more frank conversation about the goals um, and plans for the child that may differ from the cultural norms that they are accustomed to but that to help them understand that those things they can continue doing at home but at school these are the things that we need the child to do. Uh, adult child interactions um, you know it is very uncommon for a child to sit and play with an adult sometimes uh, mostly the play is with siblings or other children, um, and the extended family is responsible for taking care of children. So, um, you, you, you got to think about that, that they, a lot of these families consider other siblings of playmates and not the actual mother or father. 
uh, and you know adjusting to new life in America uh, limits the parents availability to engage with the child on a one-on-one -on -one interaction so you know working and here in this country we work a lot a lot more than in other countries and so um, these families are trying to get used to used to that and so and we might want the parents to spend more time doing exercises uh, you know some kind of learning exercises at home but they can't because they're they're still trying to get used to the way we work here so that's where the extended family comes in and is responsible sometimes for taking care of the children so maybe those are the people that we need to be working with um, and you know trying to help uh, help them move forward in their goals at school that they can generalize back to home. Um, the expectations for child development can be very different. Um, you know, some focus more, some families focus on the child's social skills and rely on educational system to introduce liter literacy related activities. So asking the parent to make sure they read at home with their child may not be viewed as important because they may feel that that's the job of the school. Um, and so they may not follow through with that. Um, they, uh, some families believe that, you know, some of these, um, the curriculums that we might use in early childhood or are pushing um, skills on these children at home um, so that they can be doing age appropriate things. Some families be like, you know what, their kids, they need, they'll figure it out on their own. Um, they'll, they'll, they will develop on their own schedule in their own time, which can be hard for us because we are so uh, worried about making sure our kids are meeting their goals and being able to take tests and do good tests. So it, 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 again, it's that balancing act that you have to have and how you approach the family on those issues is key to keeping an open line of communication. Feeding. Food and feeding. That's extremely important to um, a lot of refugees. It's important to everybody, but the way it is done um, is uh, can be very different for families that come from um, a different background. Uh, you know, I remember working in a school where the child that I was working with was African. They were from Africa, and the mother would come every day at lunch to feed her child. Now, the child, I'm not talking, this, the child was not four years old, the child was about seven. But the mother would still come and make sure that they were the ones feeding the child. Um, which looked kind of, you know, silly and socially inappropriate. But, you know, we had to work on that with the family to let them know that, Yes, we understand that this is your culture, but in the in the school, you know, we we don't want the child to be picked on. We want to make sure that the child can learn to be independent and and look and you know assimilate into the school culture, uh, and so not to discourage what they do at home as a culture, but to have them understand there's a time and place for everything, and this is how you know we really recommend it be done. Um, You know, eating with spoons and forks may not be common in some cultures. I know I have friends who are from India, and everything they eat is with their hands um, or with um, bread and naan. They fold it up in, like almost like a scooper, and then they scoop their food up that way. Um, or if they have rice, they might wet the rice a little bit with some soup and make like rice balls and pop them in their mouth. And so, you know, you might see them doing these, type, these types of things happening in the school lunchroom. It doesn't mean that the child is dirty. It doesn't mean that the child can't use a fork or spoon. It's a cultural thing. They eat with their hands. Books and writing tools. Um, you know, kids and families that come from cultures that are, um, you know, oral cultures, um, they may not be exposed to books and writing tools. So they may not know what to do when they get here, and we give them, you know, books and school supplies. Um, you know, they may not have ever had that, depending on where they come from, and if there's war, and they're trying to escape war. I mean, just all these other things that we don't really necessarily think about, but are happening. So when you get a student, it's just something to find out what the background is. Uh, even if you don't, if the parents don't want to fill out a questionnaire, maybe making a phone call or scheduling a time where you can meet and, and talk so that you can get to know these families and understand why or why not things why things are going the way they are or why the child performs the way they do. Um, if the kids are not exposed to books and writing tools, their performance of screening tools may not reflect their actual ability because then we are penalizing them for 
their culture, their cultural beliefs, and what happens in that culture. And we need to not do that. So, um, you know, looking at an assessment where we're trying to mark whether or not the student can do A, B, or C, and we say, no, they can't, but it's not that they can't. It's because they haven't given an opportunity or it's not culturally um, accepted. So we have to make a note of that when we're looking at uh, assessment results. So, um, you know, we're looking at more considerations like toys, like blocks, stuffed animals, shopping carts. There are objects used in screening tools and intervention services, and they're very culturally loaded. Um, you know, you think about a shopping cart. In some countries, they don't have shopping carts. They just carry their food in bags or in a little basket, and they bring them home. So having a shopping cart, the child may not know what to do with it. They don't understand that it's like a push toy, uh, or that's where you put food in, you walk around the store with. Um, so we have to be very careful, again, when we're looking and observing at the student, to not make a judgment uh, about whether or not they can stack blocks. I've never probably had to do that. It wasn't very important. Nobody ever showed it to them. Um, so they may just, you know, they may just throw the blocks or put them in the mouth or just never stack them. Um, and understand that, that you are trying to look at whether or not they have death perception issues. Um, so, you know, those are things you need to take into consideration. And also, um, use it's best if you can to use toys and objects that the, ch the child's familiar with and not necessarily the things that come in our in our um, testing kits let's see so you know some screening questions that use play or toys to measure developmental skills may be misinterpreted and produce invalid responses okay Again, we talked about that. Lack of exposure um, to certain toys may affect the, a, 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 a parent's responding uh, or their responses um, to your questions. That, again, doesn't necessarily mean the child can't do it. It's just they're not doing it or they haven't been given the opportunity. In sports, um, gender roles have an effect on children's engagement in sports and physical activities. Um, parents may not differentiate between the roles of boys and girls in physical activities, but as they get older, certain types of physical activities may not be considered appropriate for girls. You know, biking definitely in some cultures is not appropriate for girls um, because they have to, you know, legs on each side of a seat and their legs are open because they have to be pedaling. Um, that may not be seen as appropriate in some cultures. So, um, you know, that's something to also keep in mind if we want to put a child on a, on a trike and see if they can... Uh, get around on a trike. They may not. The child, the parent may not want us to do that, especially if it's a female. Um, you know, so we need to find another way to measure um, the skill that we may be trying to measure. So there are considerations for specific cultural groups. We've got like an Arabic um, that families from Arabic backgrounds. Um, you know, you need to make sure you follow gender protocols for cross gender interactions. Again, it may be that you, if, as a female, don't shake the hand of the male, or as a male, don't shake the hand of the female. Um, female providers should talk to males with seriousness and respect and maintain strict boundaries and avoid making eye contact. Um, you know, some of these families may not be open to signing any forms. Um, so to ensure confidentiality, you can accept oral consent. Uh, I would make a note um, that the, per, the, fair, the families didn't sign, but they're giving me oral consent, and you can write it with a date. Um, and so then that way you're covered, and, and you're, you haven't forced the families to do something that they are not comfortable doing. Um, yes, and if, if I used to love to do this, go and take an audio recorder and record the families, which helped me quite a bit. Um, to go back and understand and take and you know, type transcribed notes, but some families are not been, are not open to recording, so you're going to have to be able to take notes um, pretty quickly, or have uh, somebody go with you that can be the note taker while you're the one making the conversation. Chinese, either parent can be contacted for the provision of services. The researcher can request to talk to the mother or father privately at the time of making an appointment, but you definitely want to avoid making I. I, direct eye contact for long periods of time as it can make the parent nervous and we don't want that okay so that's just some consideration for um, Chinese families Filipino 
services cannot take place in any private place. So like no library uh, or community center. Um, basically they, they, it should say services can, they don't want the services to take place. They only want the services to take place in a private place. I'm sorry. No library, no community center, etc. So they don't want, they don't want to be out invisible in the centers, um, because it brings negative attention to them or they're ashamed or any of these other things. So you want, most of the time they want the services to be done in the home, in the privacy of their own home. Korean, contact the mothers about issues related to child hair, care and be prepared to take notes um, because they may not be open to a vo uh, audio or video recording as well. Um, so with the Korean parents or Korean mothers, they're the ones that you would be most likely talking with about their child care issues. South Asian, take your shoes off at the entrance and greet all family members in their native language. That's like, like I said earlier, Salam Walaikum or Namaste. Or hola. Um, give a good explanation for the purpose of the video recording so that they can express themselves freely during the interviews or observation uh, observations or service. Talking a very casual manner. Don't probe a lot about personal information. Um, just be relaxed. You know, having these, having a conversation about the child, adoring the child. You know, saying how cute the child is, or even playing with the child, may help a lot with that. Um, if you are going to be speaking with the mother, sometimes be prepared that the husband can be present at the time of the interview and may respond to your questions. Um, I know I've worked in some homes where I could not go and, and or interview the mother unless the father was there. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. You may have to schedule a meeting if you can't do it at the home at the school uh, and make sure that the father can also be there so that the mother can, um, can answer questions. But understand that you may be directing a question at the mother, but the father is the one who answers. And of course, only shake hands with the same sex members of the family. So if it's a, a male and you're female, just make sure when you visit them or they come to a meeting at the school that you just say hello or nod your head and wave. But for the mothers, you could actually touch or hug them, um, which would be, you know, really nice and may help break down some of those barriers and mistrust that they may have. The Sudanese services can be given at home or at a clinic. Uh, when talking to males, be serious, polite, and avoid direct eye contact. Avoid recording the interview again. Um, and, you know, don't spend too much time on written consent. If, um, if they give you oral consent, you can write that down that you were given oral consent with the date. And, um, you know, if the family is reluctant to answer personal questions, just don't probe. Just let it go. Eventually, they'll open up to you if they if they learn to trust you enough, and they'll be and you will get that information without a lot of times without even um, eliciting it. So, something else to keep in mind uh, for Vietnamese, um, you know, consult women for topics related to child development. Um, explain the consent form and accept verbal consent again if the family is reluctant to sign a consent form. Um, so, all of these things are are um, pretty easy. Um, to think about when you're going into these different um, homes of children who are, or having meetings with different um, families who come from different backgrounds. Um, for the former Yugoslavia, when determining a meeting time, consult both parents to see who wants to be present to participate in services or answer questions. So that's pretty much like our own culture here too. We, we would really like to, to see if both parent, fam, family or both parents can come um, to meetings, but if they can't, usually one or the other. Um, but always c consult with both families or both parents um, if they're from the former Yugoslavia to see if they can both be present because they a lot of times they want to be. I know in my 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 own cultural background with my family, my mother was in charge of all of that stuff. My father he didn't want he didn't bother you know he didn't want to be bothered. He didn't want to come to the meetings. He you know he didn't have time anyway to get off work. So it was all my mom's responsibility. Now, for Latinos, you know, you un understand that extended family members may have input in the services being provided. So the grandmother or the aunt or the cousin may be, uh, may be involved in the decision-making process, which um, is different for us because we usually just want to deal with the families or the, um, with the parents. But in the Latino culture, it is definitely a family affair, let me tell you. I know just from my own personal experience. Um, 
you know, again, I mentioned extended families. They may be involved in the interview, assessment, provision of services. Um, the grandmother may be the one that's answering questions for anything that you send home or, uh, or if you're trying to fill out an observation record form uh, because they're the ones that are not working, but they're the ones staying home and taking care of the child or the ones uh, volunteering at the school and making sure that, that the child is, is progressing uh, or that the child's getting what they need. Um, they may have traditional gender role values, again, where the man is, you know, the, the machista and, uh, or the, you know, that whole machismo thing, uh, and the females are the ones who handle the kids and all that other stuff. Um, you know, the, the thing about Latinos, they, they require less personal space than non-Hispanic whites, uh, when interacting socially. And physical closeness is not perceived as a violation of personal space but as a sign of being demonstrative and responsive to the person with whom one is interacting. So for me, it's like, as soon as I meet somebody, I may shake their hand, but I immediately give them a hug afterwards. If personal space is not that big of an issue with us. Um, they also may perceive service providers as distant, um, which then may lead to less participation in the in interventions of, for their children. So, you know, because we are not accustomed as providers, uh, sometimes uh, going in and hugging the family or you know, um, hugging the child or anything like that, they might think, man, you know, this person is really cool. Like, maybe they think they're better than us. And so you have to be aware of that. You definitely don't want there to be any anim animosity there or any issues there uh, when it comes to uh, the closeness of uh, in the families who are from uh, Hispanic or, Latin or Latino background. So what's also important to understand is that even though Spanish in general is pretty much the same, there are different dialects. Um, Mexican dialect, Puerto Rican dialect, um, you know, uh, Argentinian dialect, and there's just different dialects. So, you know, I always talk about how when I would do assessments, if I would ask the child to tell me what, what, what the, uh, a picture of a bus is, they would either say, moves, out the woods, um, and then that would be the Mexican term. Puerto Rican term would be guagua. It wouldn't make. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just a different dialect, different type of Spanish. Um, so it's it's really important for you to to understand the dialectical differences between um, mm. Spanish languages. So I just put this table in this presentation so that you could see an example of what the Mexican terms are versus the, what the Puerto Rican terms are. Now, this assessment tool um, is, is one that we use, I know here in Illinois, um, when we do an intake screening um, for early childhood or even for preschool. Um, and it is very culturally um, sensitive. It's uh, one that, that, uh, that is approved by the state for us to use. And so um, I included links here to the actual video recording of the training to, to receive some training on the ages and stages questionnaires uh, and so if you get a chance to go through those websites and take a look then you can see what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about using a tool that is um, sensitive to the cultural diversity of the families that we work with. Again here's a list of all these resources that, um, that I've used and that I wanted to make sure that you had so that you could refer to them um, throughout your studies and even afterwards when you're a TBI. The main takeaway from this presentation that I want you to have is um, there are a few, not just one, but you know, use approaches that honor and respect family and cultural diversity in all interactions. Um, seek to find family assets and strengths for collaboration toward mutual goal setting. It's easy for us to find negative assets uh, and to find the weaknesses in families. Uh, but we need to really focus on the positive things and the strengths that these families have and use that to help us um, towards that mutual goal setting. Um, again, you want to facilitate the assessment using the family's interests, ideas, and frames of reference. Uh, employ individualized and flexible approaches consistent with family identity. Suspend your judgment when approaching issues for which you are unfamiliar or uncomfortable. Um, you know, if, if you have nothing good to say, don't say it. That's, that, that, that I think still rings true um, in this arena. Uh, communicate clearly how the family can be involved in intervention services. 
So basically, when we go in, or, you know, we are not babysitters. We're going in to provide services to the child to teach the, child, the, the, the parents how to work with the child when we're not there. So, you know, make sure that they clearly understand that you're not there to give them respite or a break. You're also there to teach them, too. So, thank you for listening to this um, screencast. Uh, again, my contact information, uh, I believe, is on the front slide, but I also have it here on the, the last slide. Um, please feel free to email me uh, if you have any questions um, or give me a, a call. Uh, or if you want, you can send me a, an email letting me know that you would like for me to call you, and I would gladly do that. Um, so thanks so much. I hope you learned a lot from this, and um, you know, good luck.